like to thank Elements Awareness Circle with all of your efforts to help organize what will be our first of many educational sessions. This is, Albus, you are our inaugural event. We're really excited to have you. Awesome. Um, so today we are thrilled to welcome Albus to the Elements family, along with our distinguished guests. We have some people here from outside the organization and are thrilled that they chose to join us as well. I became connected to Albus through the Downtown Denver Partnership. Currently, I sit on the Diversity and Inclusion Council that he chairs and on the management board with him. Um, upon the completion of our diversity, equity, and inclusion plan, I went to Albus to preview it. One of the first things he asked me after looking at it was how we landed on the number eight for the number of facets that our plan holds. And he reminded me that eight means renewal and new beginnings in the Bible. And that was really impactful for me. It's when I knew that we had this thing right. So upon his endorsement, we moved forward. Um, for today, Albus will present to us leaving about 15 or 20 minutes at the end for Q&A. So please post your questions in the chat throughout the presentation and he'll pick them up as he chooses, as he goes or potentially at the end. And a little bit about him, he's got quite a distinguished resume. So Albus pursued his calling for community development by working with young people in Denver's poor communities he served as the director of the Issachar Center for Urban Leadership, an organization that invests in Denver's emerging leaders. In 2010, Albus worked to elect then mayor John Hickenlooper as governor of Colorado, acting as the statewide outreach and political director. This exposure to political leadership led him to seek public office. And in 2011, Albus defeated 38 opponents to become the youngest African-American ever elected to the city council. And by the way, he was in our district. Woo, woo, woo. Um, serving two terms on the Denver City Council, including two terms as council president, Albus accomplished an ambitious range of progressive legislative victories with the goal of building a truly inclusive city. Three accomplishments that I will highlight will follow. To address the affordability crisis, he co-created Denver's first and Colorado's largest affordable housing fund. To make Denver a more equitable place to grow up, he funded and expanded the Denver Preschool Program, providing universal access to preschool for all four-year-olds. And he decriminalized marijuana possession for those 18 to 21 years old, preventing thousands of young people from entering the criminal justice system. Albus originally moved here to play football at the University of Colorado, and he has chosen to stay in Denver. He has his MBA from the University of Denver. He is now the Vice President of Business Development and Strategy from Millinder White, a GC and development firm that we actually get to work with. And they operate in Southern California and in Colorado. Alba sits on multiple boards and commissions and has been a part of the following national and international fellowship programs, the Marshall Memorial Fellowship, the New Deal Leaders, and the Aspen Institute Riddell Fellowship. Although a, a rising global leader is in the heart of Denver where Albus feels the most at home, he lives in the Cole neighborhood with his wife, Debbie, and their three beautiful young children, Makai, Kenya, and Kaya. And if you Google Albus and his story, he will, and his family will come up and they're just absolutely beautiful. So with that, Albus, <laughs> thank you. Christy, thank you. Uh, you didn't have to read all that but I, I really I do wanted to I really do appreciate you and uh, elements and all the other uh, partners and friends welcome um, I just got to say you know Tracy is is a real inspiration to me because I think I get a chance to talk um, about this subject with people all over the globe um, and uh, particularly uh, if you are white listening to this topic, I think it can be, um, it can be hard and it can be off-putting. Um, <laughs> but Tracy uh, has, we've been in this conversation for a little bit, even before COVID, and it was stirring, um, uh, not even, you know, not just in her soul, but in her head of how do we, how do we do something about it? How do I, in my context, um, take a step towards action. And, 
And I, I really want to begin today uh, by using her as an example, because I think that's what we all need to do. Stop thinking about how do I change the world? Let's think about how do we change ourselves? Um, that's the real goal of this. What can you do today in your own context um, to, to live differently and, and to uh, live a life of transformation and not do <laughs> what our ancestors have done in, in, in this country uh, and in this world? So should we jump in? We're going to jump in. And I, I like the call and response. And so, you know, um, it's kind of hard doing this with 100 people on here. But, you know, if you feel like, you know, I come from that old Pentecostal faith tradition where if somebody say something good, you're like, yes, amen, brother, I feel you. <laughs> or I'm struggling with that. You can use the comment box, you know, for our, our Western way of very organized and meticulous way of thinking. You can use a comment box, but for, for those of you who just are more kinetic and screamer type learners, go ahead and do this. I'm going to share the screen and we're going to get going. All right. So uh, everybody, my name is uh, Albus Brooks, uh, like Tracy was saying, and it's just a, a privilege to be with you. I, um, I love Colorado. Uh, I've been here for over uh, 25 years. I, um, Got a chance to come here and play uh, for the University of Colorado. I thought I'd play sports, uh, but I, I think I had a calling in my life to do some other stuff and bring people together and, and try and rebuild our city. Now, I had this, ever since I've been working on city council for the last 10 years in downtown Denver, the most eclectic, diverse, desperate, disparate district from billionaires to homeless folks and everything in between, Black, Hispanic, white folks, and trying to bring them together and build a city. What I've noticed is that we have a broken city. And so I used to always talk about rebuilding the American city, and people would be like, well, what's broken? Well, <laughs> this thing called COVID came along that really sat everyone on their ass to really think about how we're experiencing life individually, how the world is experiencing life, and then George Floyd happened. And I never had to talk about why it's important that we rebuild the American city um, again, because, um, can you guys, let me make sure that, did that change? Hold on, there we go. Did that change for you, Steph? Yes, it did. Okay, great. So <clears throat> no matter what this, what perspective you come from, on what you think of Black Lives Matters. Um, this picture represents something that is so important for us to sit and reflect on. There is a book that many of you probably have read called The Highly, um, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And one of the habits is seek first to understand uh, and then be understood. And, and I really want you to be in a place where you're trying to just understand. And understand this, Martin Luther King said, riot is the language of the unheard. And the people who um, were upset and even destroyed our cities um, were screaming out for injustice that they've experienced their entire life. And that is what we're gonna talk about. We're gonna take a, we're gonna take a view in to that injustice. And I'm only gonna use one policy uh, I'm not going to go through all the slavery. That's a big enough injustice. I'm not going to go through the Jim Crow era. That's a huge injustice. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share with you one policy um, that should impact you on how this injustice is and how high in our government it goes up to really discount Black lives. So something that I really agree with, and I think everybody on this call agree with, agrees with that after World War II, um, you know, we supported the GI Bill, right? It was passed through Congress, uh, the president signed it, and the GI Bill is benefits for soldiers who participated in the war. A little bit of historical analysis. African Americans were not able to fight with weapons at the beginning of World War II. African-Americans dug latrines for white soldiers 
so they could use the bathroom. They were manual labor. So my grandfather, Albert DeLoach, uh, fought to serve uh, white soldiers. Later on, he was a part of the first kind of platoon that was able to use guns and actually fight um, Germans in Berlin. Um, and a really powerful story. I was working at the, uh, you know, I was a part of this German Marshall Fellowship, was a fellowship program in Berlin. And my mom sent me a letter that my grandfather wrote when he was there and he was being demeaned by white soldiers in his own platoon. And he said, I'm taking this demeaning by soldiers because one day I will have um, grandkids who will be leading in our country. And I was sitting there in Berlin as a elected official, a black elected official. It was a powerful moment. Um, but that's a, an aside. That is what blacks were experiencing in World War II. So what did that lead to? Well, one of the things it led to is that um, the GI Bill was denied 1.2 million black soldiers. So even though they went over and fought and served this country, they did not reap the benefits. A lot of people say, there's no way that this happened. Go ahead and Google it. There's a whole show on it on uh, the History Channel. It's unbelievable. So these black soldiers came back and they were not able to invest in land, not able to um, go, you know, this was during a time when all the soldiers went back and we had suburban sprawl all over. That was subsidized by our country. That did not happen to black soldiers. So on the white side, you'll see it here. It's a little, this is, a, this is an interesting slide, right? It's on, the, it's on the white side, but it's in black, right? So the GI Bill, it, it, it promoted white flight, subsidized sprawl, political representation, intergenerational inter health, sensing leniency, access to higher education, access to health care. It equaled compounding interest and gain. However, on the black side, we see redlining, eminent domain, condemnation laws, urban renewal, race rights, Jim Crow laws, voter disenfranchisement, mass incarceration, health disparities, exclusion from the GI Bill, and wage gap. And that equaled compounding loss and pain. I'm telling you, that one decision by the federal government to deny black soldiers their benefits created a cataclysmic racial systemic um, effect that we are still experiencing to this day. So what do we do with that? There is a uh, as you can see here, I, I think, and, and, and I want you guys to put your place in this picture because you come, some of you guys have lived in Denver, some of you have moved to Denver, doesn't matter, all of you are city builders. Um, Denver is a type of city where you can really put your fingerprints on and shape it. And if you do not know the history of how cities are built, you are a part of the issue um, and the systemic racism that continues to go on if you don't do something about it. So I love this quote that talks about, it's so important that we take sides. First of all, that we learn the history and we take sides um, and that we are not neutral. We are not silent. Neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. Silence encourages uh, the tormentor and never the torment. Our silence is violence and our neutral behavior adds fuel to systemic racism because we don't say anything and we do nothing to fight it. One of the things that um, I always want to do is make sure that people have, especially um, in this space where we're city building, I'm in construction and development. Um, you guys are at Elements, so you are in development as well. You are uh, in aspects of construction. W those of us who are in real estate, if we don't understand how cities were built, what are we doing, right? 
we have to understand in this book, The Color of Law is one of the most powerful books that actually, it doesn't lead by emotion, it leads by raw fact and legal analysis of what happened during segregation in our cities, mostly around redlining. And, and to let you all know, the next slide kind of talks about that a little bit, but redlining is the systematic uh, segregating of our cities and, and not allowing individuals who are of a darker complected skin live in certain areas. They were denied access to certain areas because of the color of their skin. This was federal law. Think about that. Federal law. So the wounds of injustice are not easily healed, but healing begins only when we learn from past mistakes. So this next slide um, talks about how this segregation kind of impacts the city's economy. So this anti-black racial entity is something that we see uh, even to this day. This is, oh no, I don't want to have, I don't want to live in a neighborhood where there are a majority of black folks. I don't want to go to school where there are a ma majority of black folks. I don't want to work where there's a majority. It is a, it is a, it's a theory. It's, it's, it's a, it's a way of life. Um, that we see in America. And that is how redlining started. And then you get to the, so, the spatial mi mismatch theory. So because I don't wanna live with black folks or work with them, we put them in a certain section of the city and we draw a red line around them. We live in the city of Denver. Has anybody been on Ray Street? Ray Street was an important part of redlining in Northeast Denver. I mean, there's a reason all of this is systemic racism that we see from years past. So the spatial mis mismatch theory is putting individuals in a certain part of town and then saying, we're not going to put any of the resources near you. We're not going to make sure you have a good bank. We're gonna, not going to make sure that you have proper schools. You're not going to have uh, access to um, affordable and, and good food and healthy food. And so when those areas get gentrified, like a lot of my areas did that I represented, I had a lot of white um, uh, individuals and, and constituencies like, why is there no grocery stores in this neighborhood? Where is the uh, rec centers? There's nothing in this neighborhood, what's going on? I'm like, oh my gosh, you're learning about redlining. This is what happened in our cities. And we're still seeing that to this day. And then the culture of poverty theory is now we have put you in this area. We have separated you from all these goods. And now we are, we have relegated you to a life of poverty. And we look at you and say, if you just pulled up your boots by the straps, you would be good. You see how sick this whole mentality is. And a lot of folks who are, who, who are ignorant and uneducated just keep saying this and they don't even know how cities were built and what kind of incredible pressure we put um, people of color under in our own cities. So what do we do? Gosh, what do we do? So um, I've done a lot in my life, been a football player, uh, recovering polit politician, community organizer. I was actually an ordained minister. So spiritual life is so incredibly important to me. I think that is the deepest part of who we are as people, is our spirit. And so there's one um, Hebrew word that I love, and it's shalom. And most people think it just means peace, but it's actually healing, right? It's restoration. It's repairing. It's inclusive prosperity. And I think we all, um, everybody on this phone, before we do one thing, before we do anything, we need to recognize what kind of posture we want to have before we rebuild anything. And I'm telling you, the pro posture I want to have is shalom. I want to have a restorative, a repairing um, posture because you can get pissed doing this stuff. Trust me. Because some people will say some stuff that you like, are you serious? And then you realize, oh, shoot, you're ignorant to it. You don't know. Let me educate you. 
right? Let me show you, let me, let me help you with some perspective. But if you don't recognize your posture, you're just going to be walking around mad. And um, I don't want to do that to my own health. <laughs> and I don't want to live a life like that. And so I want to live a life of uh, shalom, where, listen, I'm, 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 I'm a peacemaker, right? I'm about to make peace. Now, you don't have to listen. It doesn't matter. It doesn't, doesn't distract my drive, my purpose, my passion for what I'm trying to restore in my own community. But this is who I'm going to be. So now we get to action, um, which I love. I love to work. I, I'm, an, I'm an action-oriented individual. So this is how we begin to rebuild, especially as it pertains to the city. Um, for the first time, uh, we, we passed this in 2018. Maybe those of you on the call have been a part of this, but Blueprint Denver, which is our overall uh, uh, plan for the city of Denver, finally has the words equity. It has a lens, it sees everything through a lens of equity. And as we review cities, as we, I'm sorry, as we review neighborhoods and neighborhood plans, it now has some equity requirements in it. So we're not uh, just developing a part of our community, but we're developing a community as a whole and we're making, sh we're making sure we're focusing on communities that have been overlooked and very proud to be a part of that work um, I mean, we literally were in meetings saying, why should we focus on, you know, black and brown communities where they had the lowest reading rates, the highest unemployment, the worst obesity rates, you know, like, it's like clear, you know, the inverted L in Denver is all of those rates. Most COVID, um, the highest COVID rates are in those areas. And we know why we've done this to these communities, um, but we changed it. And I think we're changing as a city, which is great. Um, redesign, the way designers shape uh, the built environment. Everybody on this call in some way is affecting our city. And I really want you to think about in your own context, how do you um, redesign and relook at, at this. And, and one of the things that I would do with planners uh, at the city of, Ten of Denver would say, you know, it's not just the registered neighborhood meetings you need to go to. You need to go to the church meetings. You need to go to the community meetings. You need to go to the gang meetings. Man, that was a funny conversation. Uh, everybody looked at me like, what the? Those are incredible constituents. You can get the best information you ever heard, but that's a whole nother conversation. How do we look different and get in a different context for how we uh, redesign cities? And then rebuilding. And this is, uh, this is in my bailiwick right now. Uh, I have really put it as one of my passions and in being in this industry, not only to change uh, the complexion and conversation around construction and development in my own company, but how do we do it for the whole metro area? And so we've already started on this, but the places we're doing development in, those individuals need to be trained and be a part of the economic success um, that is happening in their own communities. And so we're really excited about this. Okay, this is a little call and response. Anybody know who is that, that guy with the scissors in his hands? I need you to unmute yourself and just say who it is. I know we- can. Nipsey Hussle. Come on, that's what I'm talking about. That's, that is young Nip right now. Unfortunately, uh, he was assassinated, and he is from Crenshaw, Los Angeles. It's uh, where I'm from in L.A., and uh, this is such a powerful picture. Let me tell you why. Nipsey Hussle is a rapper, very, very famous. Um, you guys can go and uh, Google him when you, when you get home, but he changed the game because he no longer – you see, he has some – <laughs> some chains on and stuff, but he wasn't about that. He was about buying property in his neighborhood that he saw developers redeveloping. And so he has a song where he talks about him sitting on the curb selling drugs and the owner calling the police on him. And he goes, that was the best moment of my life because I'm gonna buy that building, <laughs> right? He, he, he flipped the script in his head. And this 
this um, slide for me is more for the community, but I think it's important for all of you all who are on this call to say, who are the Nipsey hustles in our neighborhood that we can empower? And I don't even want to use empower because empower, empower means, you know, infers that that individual does not possess power and they do. But who are the individuals in our neighborhood that we can support to be the next Nipsey hustles uh, in their own community? Very, very powerful uh, slide. This is another uh, powerful slide. You know, we talk about affordable housing. A lot of the affordable, I probably was a part of uh, putting together 2,500 affordable housing units in the downtown area, uh, which is, is, is great and amazing. But we saw a lot of them were going to millennials uh, who were moving here from other uh, cities. Not that they don't deserve a place to be, they do. But what about the displaced mom with two or three kids? They, they deserve a place. And so uh, something that's uh, passed in the city of Denver and other cities is making sure affordable housing is for displaced neighbors first, um, that they have the first right of refusal in those places. And this particular uh, location is in the cold neighborhood. There's a long story about it. Um, I was on council and we got a chance to take land from a slumlord in our community whose name will, will go unnamed right now. Um, but we took this land and we, um, we, put, we put it to an affordable housing developer and they called it Clara Brown Commons. You can look up her name too. Very, very powerful woman from Colorado, a former slave turned millionaire, turned poor because she gave all her money away um, to the poor in her community. She is an American and Colorado hero. She's, uh, she has a picture up in uh, the state capitol. Um, I made, made my young girls read her entire story. It is, it is powerful and inspiring. Um, this is something that I think uh, creating an entrepreneur center uh, for people of color specifically gets to what I mean when I say equity. Equity is repairing what was taken from a community. And a lot of people have a problem with this. Like, why, well, why would we single out? I was like, because we singled out folks of color when we wrote in the laws to um, disenfranchise them from the rest of their opportunities. That's why. And I think people are starting to see it. J.P. Morgan Chase um, just recently committed $30 billion nationwide to uh, communities of color and startup businesses and, and, and opportunities. And we need, we need this in Denver. Uh, we've been talking to the mayor about this and um, we believe that this uh, is gonna be in, in the Five Points community, which I'm gonna talk about right now. Um, Five Points community, a lot of you all know. Um, I think you, everyone knows this, but Elements is, is actually in Five Points. Um, it's in the part of Five Points we call Rhino. Uh, all of that is Five Points. Rhino is an arts district. And, uh, but this part of Five Points is the historic Five Points on Welton. Um, it was redlined. African-Americans could not live anywhere else. Lena Horn, Dizzy Gillespie, Charlie Parker, some of the jazz greats would travel and come here. They play here, they play downtown. They couldn't stay downtown because they were black and they would stay at the Rissonian. And um, it was just a hot, hot place uh, in the 50s and 60s. And in the 70s and 80s, the crack epidemic, uh, poverty, most of Welton was boarded up. Well, now we're starting to see a black renaissance in Five Points. And even, even if you go to Five Points and you see Rosenberg's Bagels, right, which doesn't seem like a black uh, <laughs> shop, it's owned by a black woman. They own the, the storefront, which R Rosenberg's is in. So most of Five Points is almost 60% Black-owned um, on Welton, which is super exciting. And all of these pictures are individuals who uh, have been, I'm in a couple of those pictures when I was councilman, we really put some efforts forward to catalyze development, which a lot of people saw as gentrification, but it was Black-owned, um, which we thought was really important. Let me... This is my last slide and I really, um, 
you know, as, as we think about what, what is the future of cities? Um, what's going to happen? Uh, this is what I think the future of cities are. It isn't one with flying cars and towers that reach the heavens. It's about regen the regenerative ecosystems, the inclusive economies, the just societies where equity and social mobility go hand in hand. You know, I'm tired of us saying as a city, a state or a country, the economy is booming. It's incredible. When we measure social mobility the same way we measure economic outputs, that's when we have a just society and that's when our economy is booming. So just something to reflect on. All right, that's all I have for you. I'm wondering if um, there are some questions. There were a couple in the chat, Albus, you might just quickly, I think a couple of you had something about the design and development. Okay. So Pull those up. One was, what are some specific examples of how Denver is redesigning, rebuilding to focus on inclusion and equity? Yeah, so, you know, I mentioned the large, um, you know, Blueprint Denver, which is the, it's kind of the larger plan to, to, to put Denver in the right direction, how we look at development. Um, my best example right now is what's happened in Five Points, which we kind of talked about. I think uh, the development that's happened in Five Points and how we catalyzed that at the city of Denver, we actually took, um, we called it the Welton Street Challenge. And we knew most of the owners were African-American. And so we, we took about a million dollars at the time, I believe it was 500,000. And we asked them to team up with developers and we would put seed money to their development. Um, that was directly centered at black ownership in ways that we could really catalyze development. Um, another example, um, you know, I think we did on, on five points is started to tie our public money to black ownership, <laughs> which a lot of people struggle with, trust me. Um, but we did at the Rossonian and, um, I just got to give a shout out to Paul books who was the owner of Rossonian. He, he is white. Um, but he's a great guy and really gets this stuff and said, you're right, and partnered with other Black individuals, uh, uh, Matt Burkett and some other folks to do that development. So those are the type of things we're going to need to do. It's hard to pass laws like that because our laws, um, you can't discriminate against a race, right? So um, you can do women and minority-owned businesses and things like that. But even when you do women and minority-owned businesses, you know who's at the bottom? Black individuals are at the bottom of those because there's so many other um, uh, cultures that have access to capital and things like that. And so that's why um, what I've really seen in the community is that we direct and we focus our equity building um, on the people who have uh, been, been disenfranchised the most. Are you glad through those or do you want me just to pull out a few or maybe we have some people from the awareness circle that want to read them some questions here. It might be easier for them. Um, yeah, I can. Let me let me look through here. Let me look through here. Um, okay. <laughs> um, so Tracy put this in here. And Tracy, I don't know if you want to talk about it a little more, but what do you know about the information presented by the DBJ article in the last couple of weeks that the SBA lent 84% fewer loans to Black businesses owners since 2007? Is there anything else you want to say to that? Well, no. I mean, I just read it. It was an insert in the DBJ, and I was astonished. It was a huge front page quite large. You know, the SBA is a federal agency, right? And the fact that they are lending 84% fewer? I, I just found it astonishing and appalling. And I was just more curious as to your perspective on that. Um, um, you know, this is, this is hard, right? This is hard stuff because this is national, um, national policy that was set up. I showed you, I, I talked about different laws that were set up not to lend to African-Americans. And to change that is really hard, both from a macro, you know, lending perspective and from a community perspective. Mm -hmm. 
there are so many stories of small black businesses who have been turned away, denied. And someone might say, well, that happens all the time. Um, it's, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking right. about incredible disparity. Yeah. They're 10 times more likely, 15 times more likely. So that's not a shock. It's a disgrace, to be quite honest. And that's why um, we have to, Tracy, I want to talk to you about what we're trying to do around this, but we got to do something big. Yeah. Big. And we have organizations like JP Morgan Chase. We have other local capital who are saying, hey, we want to do something. And I think it needs to be centered um, in one place. Maybe it's the, the partnership. Maybe it's some other folks where we center a fund and we just start developing, curating opportunities for um, Black-owned and uh, brown-owned businesses uh, who have been you know, not receive these funds. It's really sad, but I think it's yeah. I'm glad you brought that up. These are facts, folks. This isn't, uh, you know, a person up here just, you know, making up some, something emotionally. These are facts that are happening in our own community. Oh, and you may not, you may also say, well, there's not that many black folks here, Elvis. There's <laughs> not that many brown folks here, Elvis. Did you know that the city of Denver is nearly 50% people of color. So let me break it down for you. Sometimes when you look at the census, you see non-white, or you know, they have that weird deal where they, they bunch Latinos and whites together. So that's not the real numbers. The real numbers is Denver is about 33, 34% Latino, about 10% uh, black, and that number's on the rise. A lot of black professionals are moving to Denver because of these startup jobs and things like that. We just had another big um, company is moving here from, from Japan. Now, I know they're not black Japanese, right? But because of the jobs from all over the country, they're moving here, which is crazy. Um, and then the rest others. So about 40, 45 to 47% people of color. So mm -hmm. I just want to debunk that myth that we don't have the there is a lower threshold of African Americans for sure, ten percent, but you know we're not even close to touching that. Um, okay, there is. Uh, let's see, There's some good questions in here. Okay, how well do you think Denver is doing in this planning area compared to other cities? I think Denver's doing pretty good. Um, we got some we. We're planning really well. What we're not doing well is, and I didn't know it until I got here, is in real estate and development. <laughs> I'm trying. It's worse than I thought. I mean, I've had real conversations with developers and folks in the construction industry. We're starting. We just did this big deal at, at MSU to, to build a pipeline of, of Black construction work. But in the development field, it's sad, like sad. So we got a lot of work to do there. Um, but, you know, things like the stuff at Welton is really helping uh, to really change the conversation. Uh, not so much the complexion yet, um, but that's just something that's, you know, if I'm, if I'm honest with you guys, uh, what I'm seeing. Okay. Um, let's see here. What, okay, what would be the best way that we could locate and support minority-owned businesses? Um, <clears throat> I think that's a really good question. There are a ton of minority-owned businesses, and I'm forgetting the name of it right now, and I'll get it to Tracy, um, and you guys can kind of um, get back to where, but there is a whole catalog of Black businesses in Denver just been created um, and I'm, I'm forgetting what the name of it is and if somebody does remember you can put it in oh somebody put just put it in there I don't know if that's what you're talking about but that's a good go-to and there's additional resources within that article see that's why you got folks you, you, we are a community we're trying to bring stuff together you know what I'm saying Chelsea got my back all day thank you okay um, there was someone asked a gentrification one which I wanted to see. Is gentrification, non gentrification the real threat to neighborhoods? The bad G word. 
complicated topic. It's a loaded word. Um, displacement, I think, is more um, a more accurate uh, description of kind of what's going on and 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 what we need to be addressing. Um, I I like how folks like. Nipsey have taken that the power out of that word because there uh, there is a lot of power and anger in that word in our communities in the black and brown communities and um, I mean if any of you have followed my political stuff it was really I'm about building black wealth like I'm very very clear on it and to do that um, you have to partner with industries you have to Tracy and I are friends there are some people in the community that didn't like that and see that as gentrifying, right? And so this is a loaded word, a loaded topic, but I like to break down that topic by talking about displacement and how do we keep people in place? How do we keep people in the neighborhoods um, that they grew up in, right? Um, if they wanna stay there, right? How do we provide opportunities for that? That's not happening right now. And, um, you know, uh, the city of Denver did a gentrification study that talks about anti-displacement. There's a lot of efforts uh, that are happening, but folks are being pushed out at an alarming rate because of the how expensive it is. Yeah. I don't know if that answered your question, but um, just wanted to shed some light on it. You know, Ma Megan has a really powerful, I should say Cher has a really powerful question for you. How do you find empathy in ignorance in disheartening mm. situations? Mm. Yeah, um, I think that's when I go back um, I think that's when I go back to the, to the depths of me, right? It's like, you know, when, when I'm selfish, this ain't about me and this ain't about us. It's something bigger that's going on. And for us to really change things, I, we got to have that spirit that, that Martin Luther King had, right? And he had something that was deeper than just his intellect was off the chart. You sure, you know, we all just talk about I have a dream and stuff. You should read his writings. I have a book of his writings I read every January. It is powerful. But you begin to see this ethic that he had, this mm -hmm. spirit that he had. And we need that um, because we ourselves in our own flesh can't, can't do it. I mean, to just be quite honest, as a Black man, going through George Floyd again, I was pissed I was furious and I was really mad that a lot of my white friends didn't even say hey how are you doing like how are you doing you're a black man um and I'll, I'll share something with you guys you know I, as president of city council um I was involved in a deal I was driving down the street this car was coming at me and I avoided the car and I hit up and went against this curb and I just put my car there and I thought I was I was going to get in an accident. I was glad I didn't. A cop ran up to me with his gun drawn right to my face. And, and then he looked and he recognized who I was. And he was like, oh, I'm so sorry. I thought you, you thought what? What did you think? Like, what did you think I was going to do? What did you think I was trying to do? Um, and to realize that happens to black, brown, people of color all the time, all the time. And so don't fall into this narrative that, oh, they just need to listen to um, the police. No, 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 my skin color, doesn't matter what my position is, my skin color is an immediate offense and an affront um, to law enforcement. Now, I love law enforcement, right? My dad was in law enforcement, but there's some there's some real cultural and systemic issues that are going on with law enforcement. So I think it's important uh, that people realize that. Yeah. Albus, there's a question here about other readings you would recommend or podcasts, books. <sighs> yeah, somebody just privately messaged me the, a letter from a Birmingham jail. Yes such go go and like download that right now um dang it's so good you know why it's good it's because it's to moderate christians at the time who <clears throat> um 
they're <laughs> here is here is MLK in jail and he's writing a letter to moderates like please be quiet dude you messing up everything for all of us just go away silently and it it's a good letter because it it gets to I'm a moderate right like I think that's a lot of way I get things done is being a moderate but there's some things that doesn't work for you know, I need to be challenged in different ways. And so King was writing to moderates and like you, your, your silence is killing us. Um, and I think we all need to kind of reflect on that. Um, and then, um, you know, uh, anti, what, what's it called? Um, uh, anti-racist by, um, I'm forgetting the name of it, by. How to be an anti-racist. Let me just make, let me just. Ibrahim X. Kendi. There you go. Ibrahim has an excellent book. He has some, some podcasts, some stuff that he's on as well that I think is really good. And, and it gets back to this neutrality piece and this being a moderate and all this kind of stuff. To defeat this, we have to fight, right? We have to take actionable steps to defeat this. Um, so that's, it's real and it's honest. Um, definitely get the writings of, of Martin Luther King. Um, all of his writings, all of his speeches, his notes, everything is in one central look. It's a huge book. And it's, the point is not to read the whole thing. The point is to just let it wash over you. First of all, what you're going to say is, this brother was in his 20s? <laughs> Golly. I do it every time. I'm like, there's no way this guy's 20-something years old. I mean, brilliant. I mean, amazing stuff that they don't share. Um, so anyway, that that's that's really good. Um, any other? What else you got? Just, you just one more about your career. What did you learn in political office that you've been able to apply in the private sector? Yeah, so here's here's the deal, guys. I have a, I have a crazy story. I lost an election um, to someone uh, that was, uh, you know, to the left of me and you know, we're in this real populist environment. I'm a pragmatist all day long. And so I have very passionate uh, values, but, um, you know, I'm not going to tear anybody down. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to, I'm going to build, I'm a builder, I'm a builder. And this is an environment to tear people down. So I lost this election, which is hard because I'm very competitive, very competitive, but it was the best thing that has happened to me because now I'm in the private sector and I am, I understand how to get things done, right? So I think folks in the private sector are like, how does government work? I'm like, oh my gosh, I've been in it for 10 years at the city level and I worked at the state and, you know, uh, Obama was in office when I was elected. So I have a ton of federal experience because Obama was trying to help young brothers <laughs> come up to DC all the time. It was crazy. It was like, hey, Barack, what's up? So it was very helpful to learn that and now uh, work in the private sector and catalyze that. So I think uh, processes, um, relationships, and understanding how government works is very, very helpful for me to um, get a lot of things I'm trying to do now, which is uh, I'm, I'm deep into the affordable housing piece. I'm deep into um, hiring people uh, of color, um, and, and partnering with cities. We're doing that in Los Angeles. We're doing that here in Denver. It, it's pretty, it's pretty cool. And I don't think we'd be able to do all that without me understanding the, the nooks and crannies of how to get that done. And so that's how I think it's been helpful. Um, I had to ask our questions verbally rather than typing them. All right. <laughs> I like the call and response. There you go. Um, first of all, but thank you very much. This has been really meaningful. And I know I speak for everybody there. We've got a lot of, a, a number of really kind of motivated people who joined the awareness circle for the, for the DEI. And I was speaking with one of them today and concern was expressed <clears throat> about how to find their public voice and translate their own experiences. Cause they're going to be speaking on panels the representing elements. You've obviously kind of done this. What can you? What advice can you give to those folks to help them find their public voice? <laughs> Man, you know that what I immediately thought of. Um, 
it was 2009, I believe. And I was working in the nonprofit stuff, but I just had this burning desire to do more stuff, and like speak and, and like, um, so this is 11 years ago and be involved in government and run for office. And I remember thinking the same thing, like I need to talk to somebody, like how to help my public voice. And, and um, I can't tell you that there's any one way to do that, right? All I can tell you is that you got to be courageous and follow uh, your passion and purpose and where you are, right? So I got up and spoke at a gentrification meeting. <laughs> and probably as I look back now, it was probably the worst thing, but I felt so passionate. <laughs> like, and so I had a, a community leader say, hey, um, you didn't make any sense. Okay. But dang, there's something there, like harness that. And I just needed that, right? Um, but I don't think a lot of people, if they want that, would do that, right? They're like, well, I didn't make sense, so I failed. So I guess what I'm saying is like, put yourself out there, lean into it, make some mistakes, get called out. I've been cussed out many a times at many community meetings, let me tell you, okay? But you know what? I learned some things. I'm like, okay, I gotta work on that, I'm gonna get it. But people aren't willing to make mistakes anymore and so they don't, in public, if, if you're trying to help your public voice, you got to make some mistakes. Um, and, and I think there are, the other thing I say is get, get a mentor um, of color in the community, in the spaces that you're leaning into, who's outside your business, who's in the community. Um, and you know what that's going to, is another piece of advice. We're way too siloed, way too siloed. It's ridiculous. To the, fa to the point to where when people hear my background, they're like, you did all those things? You talked to those ministers and gosh, in the community or the activists? You talk to the downtown Denver partnership. They don't like black people. <laughs> what are we doing, y'all? For real? And I get it because I got a lot of haters because I talked to all those folks. Um, if, if we're going to heal as a country, if we're going to heal as a people, we got to step out of our silo. Um, and I think that is probably one of the best pieces of advice that I could give you um, that I'm trying to do every day. Um, and this is just a funny story. I, um, so I've been in Denver politics the whole time and now I'm, I'm, my office is in Arvada. I'm literally in Arvada, y'all. Like I'm a, I'm a downtown Denver, one mile radius my whole life. And I, not my whole life, but professional life. <clears throat> I walk into the office and they had, listen, they had Fox News on, right? And I was like, y'all got Fox News on? I mean, you, why y'all got Fox News on in this? How are we gonna make money? We got Fox. But I had to point at myself and be like, dang, I've never been into a business place where they had Fox News on. So what's that say about me, right? And so it was a good reminder to myself, even at even though I've tried to break all the silos that I still have some set up. Um, then I came to my office and put on Barack Obama's picture in my office. <laughs> they started laughing. It was funny. But I think it doesn't matter what side are you on. And by the way, I'm, a, I'm an independent, but it doesn't matter what side you're on. Like, get out of that. Like, we're not going to survive if we stay in that. Um, so anyway. Thank you. <clears throat> For the record, I think you do a better white person impersonation than Eddie Murphy does. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I wasn't trying to be white. <laughs> if you're white and you're offended, I'm sorry. I didn't. No, not that. no, just the opposite. <laughs> That's funny. That's great. Well, gosh, if there are no other questions, Elvis, I can't thank you enough. I think everyone, everybody give Elvis a round of applause either on screen. Or Thanks, Elvis. We all learned so much. It's a call to action. And from my perspective, I owe everybody in the company an update on our action plan. We have made some really good progress. I just need to communicate that back out to all of you. Hey, can I, can I say something, Tracy, real quick to everybody who's on the call? 
Uh, just real quick, guys. You're doing it right. Like, I know it doesn't seem perfect. You don't have all the answers. You never will. Just keep leaning into this because where you're at already, um, the eight, man, I, I talked to Tracy and said, you know, those eight steps, man, it's incredible. Um, you're going to see, you're going to see a lot of fruit out of that. I promise you. So just keep leaning in. And the other thing I want to warn you about is that things could get ugly. I'm sorry. They will get ugly. This is not an easy topic. Um, I mean, the, the amount of hard conversations, nasty conversations, um, but it's worth it. Gosh, it's worth it. We do not want to get, you do not want to get to the end of your life and said in this moment of time, you got shy or you got neutral, you got silent. And, and really you have an opportunity uh, to be about real transformation. So congrats guys. Good stuff. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you, Elvis. Thank you, Elvis. Appreciate it. Really appreciate the time. You guys have a good one. Thank you.